um, we are going to hear more about um, uh, the minimum wage uh, bill that is uh, floating around between the House and the Senate at this point, and um, it will land perhaps in this committee at some point. So I thought, or our committee thought, we should um, start hearing some information uh, prior to uh, the bill getting here. And Joyce, uh, you're here from JFO. You're going to talk about um, the the impact that it will have. And are you going to discuss the benefit clips, or are you you're doing the benefit clips? There? Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Joyce Manchester from the Joint Fiscal Office. So I think it's going to be helpful if I take a little bit of time to give you some background yes. on what went into the analysis of the minimum wage bill. So I'm going to try to do that quickly, and then we'll move right to the fiscal note, which talks more directly about the impact on the budget. Okay. So here we have the current minimum wage, which is 10.50 per hour. Um, under current law, the minimum wage increases by inflation only going forward. So starting January 1st, 2019, it will increase by the CPI, which is the measure of inflation, or 5%, whichever is less. And given the projections from the JFO and the administration, the consensus projections of inflation, it looks like inflation should stay below 5%. So we'll just be increasing by inflation. Mm -hmm. So here you can see the path... Um, and this is the path as of, what, February, so just six weeks ago, maybe. Um, and here are the inflation amounts that we're projecting, we being JFO uh, and the administration. Oh, that's oh yes. Okay. So it goes up to 1216. That is my head. Yeah, that, that, that number was just, I was cut off. <laughs> okay. And next to that column, on, uh, beside projected current law, you see $15 in 2024. So you can see how quickly or how slowly, depending on your point of view, the minimum wage is rising over time. So it's going from 1050 today up to 1110, and then 1175, 1250, 1325, 1410, reaching $15 per hour in 2024. Good? Thank you, current law. Okay. Thank you. Under current law, when will we get there? Under current law. So it, have you read the report more recently than I have? Okay. okay. Yeah. And of course, that all depends on the projection right. of inflation, which is not going to turn out to be exactly this, but this is our best guess. Yes. Okay. Now, let me just say right off the bat. Okay. So here's a good picture. Here I've shown you the nominal, at the bottom mm -hmm. line, the nominal level of the minimum wage starting in 1938 in Vermont. And then the top line, which you can see is higher, uh, adjusts that nominal amount for inflation. So this is to say, if we looked at the minimum wage in 1938 when it was 25 cents an hour, but if we adjust for price change between then and now, it would look more like $4, and let's say that's 25 cents, something like that, okay? So that's the effect of adjusting for inflation. And you can see that the minimum wage peaked in inflation-adjusted terms in 1968 at 1136. Um, in the committee, we talked about different measures of inflation, and if you use different measures, you get a different peak for that 1136, and, um, you know, we can argue about that. But... Generally speaking, there has been a, a general rise in the inflation-adjusted value and then a, a gradual decline and slight uptick. This chart ends at $10, but we could add one more year to ten fifty. Okay. I want to give you a flavor of Vermont's labor market. Um, first, it's important to understand that about 90% of Vermont workers work in firms that have 20 or fewer employees, okay? So very much a, a smaller business community. Um, those employers are responsible for one-third of Vermont's private jobs and pay 30% of private sector wages. So there are a lot of people working in small firms that don't pay very high wages, okay? Um, just to give a flavor of the industries with lots of... Um, Workers affected by an increase in the minimum wage, you can see here, gasoline stations, retail stores, food and beverage stores, 
warehousing and storage, food services and drinking places, textile and apparel manufacturing, furniture and wood product manufacturing, large food product manufacturing, nonprofits, social services, and child care. So those are the kinds of, of industries that you want to worry about when you think about um, who might be affected by the minimum wage increase and where would the pressure be, perhaps, to cut jobs or cut hours or whatever. Okay, characteristics of minimum wage workers, and this is based on a survey called the American Community Survey, so this is not absolute truth, but it's the best information we have, and this was compiled by Deb, thanks to Deb. So we, we saw in the early 2010s, okay, this is actually over five years mm -hmm. clumping data together, about 42% of all minimum wage workers are the head of a family, so either a couple or a single parent, <coughs> and 40% of those workers earn at least one half of their family's income. 59% of all minimum wage workers are over age 30. So lots of people have the idea that this is just a wage at a starting job and that people grow out of that job into higher paying jobs. That's not always the case. Um, so we have almost 60% over age 30. About half are female, no, I should say, half of all female, Finish your sentence. Okay. Half of all female minimum wage workers are older than 40. Only 32% of all male workers are older than 40, so there's quite a, a gender split there. Uh, and just to finish this, 49% of all male minimum wage workers are under the age of 30. Only 36% of female minimum wage workers younger than 30. So quite a quite oh, interesting. Oh, just, do we have this? Yes, we do. In our right It's under Bill's S40, and you'll find two presentations, Joyce and Debs. So Nick just asked me, is, is, is this Vermont specific? Vermont specific, yes. This is Vermont specific. Yes, yes. Specific. and it does vary across states. Um, yeah. Uh, Bob? Um, someplace up there you were in the food industry and mm -hmm. you called it a drinking place. I presume that's a bar. Yes. But, um, but does it take <laughs> tips into consideration somehow? So, uh, Workers who earned what's called tipped wages have a minimum wage, which is different from 1050. They do now. Yes, they yeah. do now. Right. And they would going forward. And so, yes, this would account for uh, workers who end up with a wage that is less than 1050. Okay. And just one more quick one. I've got to presume, the only thing I can do is this does not take talent into consideration. Talent. Qualifications. Right. This I is mean, if you're a qualified mechanic with 15 years of experience, as opposed to a young guy out of school. So this is based on the wage, right? So this That's is looking right. at people who earn 1050 or less. Qualified mechanics are not earning 1050. They're earning. That's probably a bad example. Okay. Okay. Two individuals, one better qualified than the other. Ah. Same education. Let's call it that. And same wage? Yeah, they're going to be at the same wage. Same wage? wage? Hmm. Well, if they're, if they're making the minimum. If they're making the minimum correct, correct, correct. And, and you're right, there could be some people who are just starting out and maybe they're in a trial period and so they're getting paid, it's hard to believe, but maybe they're getting paid minimum wage for three months or six months and they would be included in this, in this count. Um, but they're going to move out quickly, right? And, and the, the demographics of who's earning the minimum wage tells you that lots of people don't move out quickly. They stay in the so, can, so, so let's say I'm at a company and I'm making thirteen fifty an hour. And the guy below me is making eleven fifty an hour. With this, we're both going to end up at 15 an hour at the same time. Mm. So Not then yet. the guy making 13, 15 an hour is going to say, well, wait a minute here. Right. So the model does take into account wage compression. Is that true? That's what they yes. call that? Mm -hmm. It's called wage compression, right? Because the guy who's earning 13 and the guy who's earning 10, right. 10, 50 are all going to be pushed up to 15, so they're being compressed all of that spot. So the model allows for the... Thirteen dollar an hour guy to to rise up above fifteen. Whoa! So his minimum wage will then go to 
sixteen fifty or something. She's like already above wage. minimum wage. He's already above minimum wage, so he would again go above minimum wage, the new minimum wage. Right. So to six he, to sixteen for maybe sixteen fifty an hour. No, no, that would just be his wage. It wouldn't be his be minimum. minimum. It would be his work. Right. Yeah, but well, yeah. maybe not his work. So he's not. <laughs> what he's saying, what he's the saying. minimum is being pushed up for those five. Four dollars and fifty cents an hour mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. than what they're making now, not simply to fifteen dollars. It's absolutely true. And exactly how much the thirteen dollar an hour guy will be pushed up, we we don't know. No one knows. We don't. We know. Should pay. But the market works. Well, I think we just figured that out. Well, I'm He'd not be sure. Coming we up that the out. same four fifty. I'm not sure that's true. So not, where not would he come up to? So I'm not exactly sure. the boss. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, well, the boss is going to put him at $15, because that's the minimum. At least He's 15. already given him a buck and a half an hour raise. If, if he's a qualified right. worker, but then he wouldn't stay. somebody else can hire him at right. 1650 or at 16 or whatever, whatever the market says he's worth. So I, yeah, it's hard to know exactly where he'll end up, but it's quite probable that he'll, he will be above the minimum wage. If he started above, above the minimum wage, the market mm -hmm. will say, we're going to find the right job for you. I guess I'm still confused, but I'll let it go for now. Did you have clarification before, Maureen? Was you, were you on a different topic? No, I was okay. clarifying then, point for then Bob. Then you and then uh, Marty both have clarifying points for Bob. Go ahead, Marie. Yeah, I just think when we're talking, Bob has to remember, going back to another slide, that when we're talking about two people coming out of school equal, um, remember, if it's a man and a woman, the woman's going to get less in all likelihood. We can't forget the gender. I, I don't even want to get into that. No, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> This side of the table. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 don't play games. We'll wear red later. So we're going to move right on to Marty. Yeah. <laughs> nice point, though, Marty. Thank you. I was just going to yes. clarify, make sure that Bob didn't think that this law was going to move the higher wage guy automatically up. No. Right. It's just that the, if the lower wage guy gets up to 15, then the guy who's already at 16 says, well, he's getting an hour and a half raise, so I want an hour and a half or dollar and a half wage. He goes to his boss and says that, mm -hmm. but the law will not make mm -hmm. that happen. So Correct. the thirteen fifty an hour guy only comes up a buck and a half an hour. <clears throat> not necessarily. Oh. See, that's where I that's where I start. Losing. So under the minimum wage law, he has to be paid at least fifteen dollars an hour, right? If if oh, his oh. employer wants him badly enough, and if he says I'm quitting my job here. Yeah, you can bring them up to 30 bucks an hour. Correct. That's right. The yeah. market determines all that. Right. Yes. Well, I, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah. As long as the market But the higher wage guy is not going to be raised just because the minimum went up. No. He may go to his boss Nobody and say... Nobody gets raised if they're over 15 or not. Right. Right. Okay. I, right. You bring it. So on the next slide, I have a question. Sure. And I'm going to try to articulate this question. It's, I know what I want to ask, but I can't figure out how to get it out. It's it, Why are we at a place, and does it have anything to do with our, our high high school graduation rates, but very low training and college rates? Why do we have such a high percentage at minimum wage? Is it because we're not doing more training for uh, skilled jobs like electricians and contractors, and we don't have the hot, more people, more students going on to, yeah, to higher education. I mean, this is concerning. That why are people stagnant there when you know in our minds the minimum wage is your entry level and you move up? Is this directly related to education, and should we be addressing education at the same time that we're addressing minimum wage? Is my question. I guess. Or is this, it, how does this compare to other states? I mean, is this what you'd expect to see nationwide, or are we much right. higher for that? Okay, so that's that's a big set of questions, which is probably worth an hour's discussion. <laughs> but um, it is true that people with high school degrees or less are the people who are most likely to be found in minimum wage jobs, and they may not have the opportunity to move up in in the wage rank. Um, it's also true 
that uh, we have a, a large proportion of people in the service sector, so ski resorts, um, mom and pop general stores, so forth and so on, and there's not a lot of room to move up in terms of, of wages in, in some of those operations. So some people would say, yes, we ought to be putting more resources into worker training and, and education and so forth. Some people would say this is an artifact of Vermont's economy that's very you know, mm -hmm. small business oriented and service oriented and so forth. So I don't have an exact answer, but there are lots of factors that come into play. And it can be a combination. Absolutely. Of Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're always going to have these small jobs available. However, if we focused, if there was more focus on training and higher education, we may be able to attract more people to do more sets of jobs and grow the economy up here as well as down here. And of course, we always hear that employers can't find the skilled workers, the highly skilled workers, to fill the jobs that are open in Vermont. Um, yet we have lots of people working at uh, minimum wage jobs. So um, something's going on there, yes. I just think this chart, or the, this one slide, makes it very clear that there's more than one thing we need to be addressing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that maybe some things should be going in tandem here. Okay. That's it for me. Kathy? Um, can you discuss the training wage, please? I think you need Damien to discuss the tra training wage. I know that there is a provision for young people who are starting off in a job. I don't remember the age. Is it? Um, certain months of the year, too, for certain periods of time. Certain right? periods yeah. of time, yes. <laughs> So they can be paid less than the minimum wage. I think it's students. Seven, it's like students, student yeah, wage. yeah. Well, some of these but people are on limited. training wages for years. That shouldn't yeah. happen. That should not happen. Yeah. No. We'll get Damien and we'll yeah. follow up on that. Will you? Yes. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, he wanted to. Uh, actually, he's next door, and he said if we had a burning question, we could bother him. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, I want to keep going here. About 8.5% of Vermont jobs, about 25,500, are at the minimum wage of 1050. Um, and then I'll talk about the wage distribution by looking at this fine chart. So this shows you the hourly wage for salaried workers as well as hourly workers. And you can see the bottom black line there is the minimum wage. It's just below the tenth percentile. The tenth percentile means that 10% of jobs are paying an hourly wage at or below that level. Okay, So you can see the, the minimum wage is catching up a tiny bit to the tenth percentile. It's grown a little bit faster since 2004. Mm -hmm. You can see some growth in the 50th percentile wage. That's the median. Half the people are above, half are below. And the biggest growth since 2004 in the hourly wage has been at the 90th percentile. And that's what we've been hearing in the news, that it's the people at the top whose wages are growing faster. But we don't, from that chart, we don't know how many people. Like the 90th percentile is growing, but what percentage of the population of workers is that? Does that show that, that and I'm yes, missing it? Yes, it does. So it says that 90% of workers are earning wages that are at or below the top line. That's the 90th percentile of workers who are. There. But that goes against the other chart. It said how many, uh, what percentage of individuals we have at the minimum wage. So am I getting into trouble here? This is 8.5 percent are at the minimum wage. Which is right there. But go, go back to the other one. Pete, go back. 42 percent of all head of households. This one, 42 percent of that's all. Oh, that's oh, just oh, the minimum, minimum wage cohort. Okay, right. got right. it. Okay. Right. Um, and just doing a quick, some quick math. That's eighty thousand dollars a year, the 90th percentile. That yeah. that 38, 85. Mm -hmm. So that's that's uh -huh. middle class. You're not talking the one percenters or anything. No, no, no. Right. You're talking no, middle right. class income. Absolutely, that's right. Okay. And remember, this is only wage income, so mm -hmm. it doesn't account mm -hmm. for other kinds of income. Sure. But, I just think yes. it's important when you say the people at the top are. Yeah growing faster to understand that the people at the top in this case are middle class. Right. Yes, and the one percenters are growing yeah. Yeah. much faster. Yeah. yeah. So I had the same comment, Peter. Uh, okay. Bob. You just quickly, what about salaried workers? Those are included Those are in the hourly workers. You can see there's a footnote oh, down there at the bottom. Yeah. So this is from a survey done in Vermont called the Occupational Employment Statistics Survey. 
So they've converted an annual wage, an annual salary to an hourly wage. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so we can also think about income disparity rather than wage disparity. That ratio has increased from 17.6 in 1967. Oh, I haven't talked about the ratio. The ratio here is the top 5% of U.S., now not Vermont, but U.S. household income to the lowest 20%. So that's a common way to think about income disparity. So that ratio has increased from 17.6 in 1967 to about 29 in 2016. So that's another indicator of people at the top doing well and people at the bottom not increasing. Um, I wanted to just mention the Vermont basic needs budget because sometimes this comes up in the discussion of the hourly wage and the minimum wage. So the basic needs budget, remember, looks at the cost of, of actual living for a single person who shares a household with another single person. And it includes items like food, housing, transportation, child care, clothing and household expenses, telecommunication, telecommunications charges, health and dental care, renters insurance, life insurance, and savings. So the... Uh, uh, Mary had a question oh, on that. sorry? Yeah. On, on that information, how accurate of a representation of the cost of living is that? And I, I, I say that thinking about the, um, I guess it's USDA's yes. standards and yes. if they were maybe arbitrarily blocked a long, long time ago and haven't been yes. modified. Can you just kind of generally? Yes. So the, the U.S. federal poverty level is based on three times, I think, the cost of a very basic food budget mm -hmm. for a person. And this started way back when at Social Security, and I used to work with the person, Molly, what's her name, who, who actually oh, did really? this. Oh. Yes. Um, but, but that was never meant to be the standard, yeah. right? And it's turned it into is, be yeah. the standard. Mm -hmm. So uh, the basic needs budget takes a rather different approach in that it adds up the actual cost in Vermont of all of these elements of living. And it is true that every two years, the Joint Fiscal Office does a review of that calculation, and this summer will be the time to review it again. So we'll see um, how we come out. But um, it does look at rural-urban difference. Uh, the the uh, livable wage that we'll get to in just a second is the average of the rural and the urban. Um, and you know, you can, you can quibble with some of these expenses, but huh, it's the best we've got at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and do you do some sort of peer review or conversation in kind oh, of yes. the community? Oh, about, yes. Do we have the right basket? Yes, yeah, so yeah. we talk to okay. people at transportation and at the housing authority and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the Vermont livable wage is this single person who's sharing housing, no children, um, employer-assisted health insurance, averaged over urban and rural areas. First estimated in 1998, and in 2016 was estimated to be $13.03 per hour. So you can see that's a bit above the current minimum wage of 10.50. It is true that the Vermont livable wage increased 2.6 per year between 1998 and 2016. The Vermont minimum wage over the same period did increase a bit faster, given those special uh, legislated increases. It did catch up a little bit. <coughs> Um, okay, I don't want to dwell on this. This is minimum wage by state in 2018, and we've highlighted the New England states and New York. So you can see Vermont, I hope you can see Vermont is bright green. So it's down about, what, sixth place. Um, Massachusetts has the highest minimum wage in New England right now. You can see New York. This is upstate New York because Manhattan and New York City have a higher minimum wage. Um, but you can see all the New England states are pretty close together, except for New Hampshire, which still follows the federal minimum wage, which is seven twenty-five wow. an hour. However, if you go across the border and look at the wanted, uh, you know, labor wanted signs, they're all advertising eleven dollars an hour because they're competing with towns in Vermont across the border, right? So. So we're going to spike right off the chart. Okay, uh, coming right up. Matt has a question. Coming so, right, I'm going to show you this in just a minute. The 
the Massachusetts one that's ahead of us, is that on a, on a later schedule or is that just a set? Okay, range? I have a slide at the very well, okay. back. Sorry. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Damien would know, like this. But I have a slide at the back, so if I don't get to it, you can check it out later. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, this is the history of, of how wages have moved over time since... Oh, no, no, no. This is going forward. Oh, good. This is going forward. So this will show you Massachusetts, which is the dark blue line. Oh, it looks like Massachusetts flat. is not indexed. Mm -hmm. It looks very flat, $11. Interesting. Okay. Um, and that's New York City large employers. It's the very top line. It's obviously very high. You can see Vermont is, is rising there to be, what, fourth highest, right in the middle. That's good for recruitment, at least. This is under, um, this is under current law. Mm -hmm. And here we have um, Vermont, still the bright green line with squares. Um, this is what it would look like under S40. So we would be coming up in the out years a bit faster than the other states. Uh, Maureen, that's fascinating. Yeah, just, um, you know, when Diane just made the comment for recruitment efforts, good for recruitment efforts, but minimum wage earners aren't likely the ones to be recruited mm -mm. or to move to Vermont, you know. Um, they're the ones who are likely to go from the McDonald's job to the Dunkin' Donuts job next door to the Grand, not Grand Union, but you know. So I don't know. They might stay in Yeah, Vermont. so I don't know we'll whether. Be able to um, to stay in Vermont. Yeah, it's expensive to move. Um, Although so I'm I mean, just not sure we could how much of a recruitment tool that would be. Yeah, that's true. There may be some in the service industry that are recruiting minimum wage workers, so I'm thinking about to stay. hotel mm -hmm. cleaners or, uh, I don't know what, school lift sure. operators get paid. But. And would that, may I? Mm -hmm. Would that include um, farm workers? I mean, how are they fitting into all of this? So farm workers may not be included in the salary in the hourly wage survey. Um, it's very difficult to get the data on the farm workers, yeah. so they may and not. That would be a recruitment. I would, you know, from what we yeah. know, mm -hmm. that people would be recruited to um, work on farms. But, mm -hmm. but you, they, so they're not included. I believe that's okay. true. Yeah. Thank you. Does that chart reflect um, legislation that hasn't been passed in other states? No. So, so if, if other law. states are considering right. something like yeah, Vermont, it doesn't right. reflect doesn't that. show up here. So that's all current law except for Vermont, which is okay. S40. Right. Then, then that's really right. It may not really be not a fair exactly chart. Accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Main, uh, uh, Bob. Yeah. What legal immigrant workers now? They're federally guided, and guidelines come as far as them getting paid through the feds. So, are they going to stay with the federal guidelines, or are they? Going no, 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 no. Any job in Vermont is covered by Vermont's minimum wage, except farmers. Farmers, are, uh, there are a few excluded classes. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Mayor, you answered it. Ah. Okay, and I put in this slide just to remind myself to tell you that the legislation includes a study. That will be completed on or before January 15, 2023, um, to think about how to index or whether to index the minimum wage after it reaches $15 an hour in 2024. Yeah. Okay, so currently there is no provision for, for changing it after it gets to 15, but there would be a study, and who knows who will be around at that point to conduct the study. Okay, so I'm now on to the fiscal note, which is very good. I'm going to be talking about effects on the state's economy because in order to think about what happens to the revenues and the benefit costs to the state, we have to think about what's happening to the overall economy. So we'll talk about employment and employees, we'll talk about effects on businesses and consumers, then we'll get down to the effects on the state's budget, thinking about both the revenue side and the expenditure side for benefit programs. And of course, you know how to find this fiscal note, it's now on your committee page. Okay, so there, there has been a lot of work done on effects of the minimum wage on the economy and on jobs and so forth. So I'm just giving you some reference materials in case you get really interested in this topic. 
So as you know, there was a minimum wage study committee that meant that met over the fall. Um, so that full report is yay thick, and it's available online here. Um, last summer, I wrote an issue brief that looks at the economic evidence on what happens to jobs when the minimum wage goes up. And there are many, many, many <laughs> published papers, peer-reviewed papers. They don't all agree. It's, it's a really interesting topic if you like to think about how analysis works. But this issue brief was meant to look at various sides of the issue. And uh, there are many materials from many witnesses and so forth from the summer study, uh, fall study committee. And that's all available, thanks to Teresa, online um, under the minimum wage notebook page. OK, so regarding Vermont's specific effects of raising the minimum wage, Tom Covett and his firm have done several analyses over the years. So I'm just letting you know that those analyses exist. And again, they can be found on, on the minimum wage web page. Um, most recently, he looked at raising the minimum wage to 1250 in 2021, 1325 in 2022. And also in the fall, the committee was focused on getting to $15 in 2022. So that's the scenario that he modeled last fall. Thank goodness the, the path that is now in S40 follows 1250, I mean, hits 1250 in 2021, 1325 in 2022, and then keeps going to $15 in 2024. So we were able to use some of the very same results on the path, right, in 2021, 2022, and then we just extrapolated to 2024, okay? Creativity and modeling is what it's called. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about effects on employment and employees. First off, raising the minimum wage would have positive effects on employees in the following way. So first, <coughs> we have seen reduced employee turnover. So employees feel more attached to their job, they feel more committed to the employer, they, they tend to, to work more productively. So we also have increased productivity, right? They, they feel more valued on the job when they're paid a higher wage. They also have increased disposable income, that means after-tax income. And as a result, they show an increased demand for goods and services. Okay, so these are all good things that happen in the economy. We have more demand that, that fuels other uh, uh, industries and so forth in the economy. So those are all good things. There can also be some negative effects. And of course, some employers will look at a person's value to the firm and say, yes, I hired you at 10.50 an hour, but once the, the wage has to rise to whatever it is, $13 an hour, I no longer feel that you're, you're earning that much per hour, okay? So there will be some job losses. There may also be reduced employee hours, or firms may decide to cut back on benefits, perhaps, or they may decide to cut, on training, cut back on training expenses. Somewhere, profitability you know, still remains, so you have to cut costs, perhaps, in the labor area. So would it be reduced hours? Would it be cutting jobs? Would it be cutting other expenses, benefits, and training. Mary, when you did the analysis of the increase in the disposable income, were you able to go deep enough to see if the costs for what people would be buying oh, yes. are also going up? So I'm thinking, in, in maybe mistakenly now, that minimum wage earners are usually have children who may, so they may be purchasing daycare, daycare costs go Absolutely. Up. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So all of that works into the model. Uh, mm -hmm. Tom Covet used the Remy model, which is a well-established, <laughs> respected model. Um, so all of those things fit together. Mm -hmm. And it is true that evidence shows things like child care become more costly. Restaurant meals will become more costly mm -hmm. because the restaurant industry hires many minimum wage workers. Um, that's all in the soup of, of the model. So it, it's all there. But it is worth thinking specifically about those industries that were listed mm -hmm. because that's where you'll see the big impact on what they produce, yeah. right? Yeah. So the net of that modeling leads you to the statement that there is an increase in this disposable income overall. 
Uh, we're going to get there. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll get there, yes. You didn't list as a negative effect higher cost of goods. Is that intentional? <laughs> This is not intentional. Um, so right now I'm talking about the effects on employment and employees, and when I flip okay. the slide, we're going to get you. to cost of living. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Slide. Oh. So all of that makes sense to me. There's one that doesn't make sense, and maybe you could speak, but slower wage growth overall. Uh, is that because you're talking about, you know, you, because of profitability, every business has a pie worth of money to give out, so if it's going to the minimum wage side, then it's not going to go but exactly over, right. over here more, so you may see a leveling out of wages across the other spectrum. Is exactly right. So this isn't the compression issue or anything like that. So the compression issue all feeds into this, but you can imagine if labor costs on average are about 70% of doing business, and you're being told you must put more of that pot into the low end, then there's less <clears> for the high end. Uh -huh. So what happens after 2024? So under current law, the minimum wage would stay at $15 per hour, but okay. flat, we flat. Have, we have, we're not addressing that? Well, That's study. why so, there's a study. Great. So what you'll find if the employer gets through all this at 2024, he's going to go out another five years or some such period of time. <clears throat> and catch his breath. Could be. Yeah. So you're going to go, once you get there, unless you force it through government, you're going to stall for a while. That, that could happen. It's up to the legislature, clearly, to decide what, what you all want to do. Um, I, I think if you think back to that chart of the historical minimum wage, there have been periods where it's been flat. Right. And then it bumps up again, and then it's been flat, and so forth. So, yeah, that's what happens. Okay, so what about effects on businesses and consumers? Well, we've talked about this already. Increased labor costs for businesses from changes in the minimum wage could result in lower profit margins. Um, might, some businesses might choose to relocate to another state or to invest in automation. There's been a lot of talk in the economics world about robots taking over in certain uh, jobs. So, so you know, if you have to pay people more, maybe you don't want so many people. Maybe you want some robots. So, that's that's a possibility. For, it's like in farming, right? Absolutely. Yep. And for consumers, increased labor costs might lead to higher prices. So here we have, for example, higher restaurant prices. Yeah. Do we have insight into the different business sectors' ability to pay? And so I'm thinking essentially profit margin. And I think that some businesses have a very narrow margin. And can we talk about that? So uh, I'm going to talk specifically about some um, niches that the state needs to worry about. For example, visiting nurses and home health aides yeah. and so forth. Uh, Deb's going to talk more about the child care sector, which is mm -hmm. definitely one that would face a yeah. lot of pressure. So um, the, the overall economic modeling doesn't go into those specific mm -hmm. sectors, but it does um, recognize that there are different effects throughout the economy. So that's sort of all rolled into a a big ball of wax, right? So I'm, I'm confident in our common ability to kind of dig into mm -hmm. some of the state-funded sectors, or mm -hmm. the you know, there's an association there. I'm I'm curious about the the typical kind of Main Street mm -hmm. business. So the small ones, not the chains, but right. the ones that are on our Main Street and their ability to be able to withstand. Right. So what you're asking about is what's the effect of raising the minimum wage on jobs mm -hmm. at the minimum wage at small mm -hmm. firms, mm -hmm. small businesses. And the best we can do is look at what has happened historically when the minimum wage has increased in other states and, well, including Vermont. I mean, there have been mm -hmm. increases in the past in Vermont. And I, I can say that the way that the studies are done is that they look at, for example, a county in a state where the minimum wage went up. Mm -hmm. And they look at a comparable county close by 
Where? Maybe across yeah. the state line where the wage did not go up, and they, mm -hmm. they see what happened to jobs here versus mm -hmm. jobs here, right? So that's the best sort of measure that we have. And it's that sort of middle of the road estimate that went into the job loss that will be reflected okay. in the model. Thank you. But there is controversy about, yeah, about <coughs> exactly how big those effects are. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Matt and Bob. Oh. So I think with, with this, one of the things that I want to look out for is the more drastic way in which we're increasing the minimum wage, not just the minimum wage increase in in general. We've done that in the past and I think that when you when you do it slowly over time like we're doing it now, it doesn't have the dramatic impact that you'd expect. What I want to keep an eye on is what happens when you if the minimum wage shoots up enough to get to fifteen dollars an hour, and everyone knows that that's the goal of where it's getting by twenty twenty four. That may have a slightly different effect than the CPI adjustment that we're we're undergoing now. I know we have a little bit of data on that from a couple places like Seattle and mm -hmm. places that have done that. Does this specifically look at those and weight those places where the minimum wage shot up instead of was just increased up? Right. So, <laughs> this is again a, a, a sort of deep subject. Um, the estimates that are used in the modeling here are sort of middle of the road estimates. And you're talking about the two Seattle studies that came out very differently in terms of effects. One of them found no effect on jobs, <coughs> even after increasing the minimum wage from 9.75 to $13 an hour over two years, mm -hmm. right? Very steep increases in a very strong economy. One study found no effect on jobs. The other study found a significant effect on jobs and wages. And in fact, low-income workers on average lost $125 per month in wages given the, the results from the second study. So <coughs> diametrically opposed results. And the jury is still out on which is correct. The, but those are the only two studies that... No, no, that, no, no. That's the, the most study. recent in a long... Oh, of Seattle? No. Of the, all... No, so I'm saying that as much as I appreciate the, the amount of data that's out there of what happens when you increase the minimum wage, what we're talking about is not just a standard increase the minimum wage. Mm. This, is a, this is a pretty substantial jump up a lot higher than you could see in the in the state of uh, when you showed the map of what our neighbors look like, we would be significantly higher from that. We'd be the first in the region. So I think that while the data of what happens when you increase the minimum wage is important, I'm really interested in seeing what happens in places that have gone to a either a much higher rate or have done it that much quicker right, for okay. what would really happen. Okay. So. Uh, let's see. So Seattle did have a very rapid increase over two years and to a very high level for the time, right? So in 2017, 2016, they reached $13 an hour, which was very high for the time. Mm -hmm. We are talking about in 2018 dollars, in inflation adjusted dollars, $15 in 2024 is about the same as $13 today, mm -hmm. okay? So it's it's not as high a level as, as $15 sounds, right? And we have seen other places that have gone to $13 an hour, adjusted for inflation, and um, they haven't all looked like Seattle. Mm -hmm. Seattle is a worrisome case if you believe the, the job loss data. Yeah, absolutely. But by stretching it out to 2024 rather than 2022, the, the Senate wanted to take that slower path that, that would not cause such big dislocation effects. I think Bob and then Marty, did you have a question about Yeah, so, you know, in Vermont, I see us as having a couple of economies. We've got the Chittenden County economy, and you compare that against the Rutland County or Caledonia County economy, and they're really different. Absolutely. Right? So, Probably not going to be much of an effect in Chittenden County, but in some. But anyways, but you also have, and I'm from Fairhaven, 
my people go to Glens Falls. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in High River Junction, you can go to Hanover. Okay. Or if you're on the mass border, there's a ton of places. I mean, and not only to be employed, but more business removal from the area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if, if you're able to figure that out. But then in the bottom of the whole thing, you've always got this thing that I think people in this building like to shy away from because it's a tough one, and that's the underground economy, mm -hmm. which is big in yes. Vermont right now. Yes. I think this is going to take it to another level. Probably so. <coughs> so all good. you collect all that stuff together, and this is getting a little on the risky side because we're a skinny little state. 65 miles across there is about all it is in the middle of the state, Route 4. Yes, you raise excellent points. They're all good points. Um, some, some people are more concerned than others about the, the cross-border differences, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont in particular, because it's so easy to get across the river there. Um, there has been a, a, a distance between the minimum wage here and the minimum wage there for a long time. And as we've seen, the businesses along the borders adjust, and so they're paying prevailing, what's called the prevailing wage, the market wage, is not so different right across the border, right? But if you drive maybe 60 miles into New Hampshire, yes, you would find wages much, much lower. So the absolutely good point. It's also a good point to think about the underground economy and, and the pressures that this will put on, on people to get away from the law. Um, In the underground economy, points. you lose mm -hmm. even more. Right. You don't get any taxes. Up. Correct. Nothing. Correct. Uh, Mark? I, I'm a little concerned. Well, I, I have a question. Do we have any data regarding the behavior of companies that would perhaps result in this or their effect with a lower profit margin? I mean, you, you indicate that, yes, some may choose to move, some may choose to invest in automation, some may choose, in my mind, to not invest in equipment and that sort of thing because of the way they have to change things. Some may find efficiencies internally mm -hmm. and be able to accommodate that. But do we have any indication regarding the long-term viability of businesses if they end up getting squeezed and squeezed in terms of what they consider an appropriate profit margin? Yes, so all of those considerations go into the modeling. And when I get to the table, we'll see that we look not only at the effects in the near term, so up to 2024, but we also think about the effects in the long term. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be looking at what happens 2028 to 2040, because in many instances it takes a while for businesses to adjust mm -hmm. to the new minimum wage and to think about their labor resources versus their capital resources and should they invest in the robot and so forth. So absolutely all of that is is part of the modeling. Yes. Thanks. We, I'm sorry, were you done? Um, yeah, no. My concern was just the long-term viability of some mm -hmm. businesses if they really squeeze hard. This were, so this question is, for me, is why hasn't the market forces gotten to the point where, where this minimum wage or the average wage now is so much higher? There's very low unemployment high demand for, for people. I would think, given that scenario, that, you know, looking at what kept it down. So what I can say is that there are two sides to the market. One is the supply side and one is the demand yeah. side. So it seems that there are enough workers willing to work at the low wage mm -hmm. such that they're keeping up with what employers want, right? So there's, a, there's a, the supply of labor, who's willing to work at that wage, and there's the demand for, for labor, who's looking for a worker at a low wage. The hope is that as unemployment stays low, right. that there'll be Better. more competition for workers and that the wage will go up. Yeah, and this is sort of forcing that to happen. Yeah. Dave? I'm, I'm, maybe I don't need to be mindful of the time, 
but yeah, well, no. Joyce, my, Joyce, what time do you need to be? I need, here? I need to be out for sure by ten thirty. And how much more do you have to? Um, we want to make sure we get to, to the impact yeah, to on you. our budget. Yeah, that, and that's where I was. Yeah. I was almost going to catapult there with my questions, but maybe I should. You should wait if it's a, if okay. the impact on the state budget. And I'll wait. Too. You'll wait yeah. too. Okay, we need to. Okay. okay, keep going, keep going. Okay, so I'm now talking about the most recent analysis, which is the fiscal note that is the topic of today's talk. Um, and I'll be talking about the direct fiscal impact for the state budget. So first, we do have increased state revenues because, of course, many people have a little bit higher income because of the increase in the minimum wage. So they'll be paying a little bit more in income taxes or other taxes and fees. Perhaps they buy more goods and services, perhaps they can afford a, a new car, whatever, whatever. So the revenue to the state will increase, and we'll see that quantitatively in just a minute. Um, we also have the impact of higher wages that must be paid to some state employees. There are not a lot of minimum wage workers who are state employees, but we do have some temporary workers and some contractors who pay um, minimum wage. We also have impacts on the state program benefit levels, and this is where Deb is going to talk in a few minutes about changes in eligibility and, and the, the effect that that would have on the cost of benefit programs in the state. And I've talked previously about the gradual increase in the minimum wage over six years, but you're absolutely right to think about um, you know, how fast is it happening and what, what is the impact of, of that increase over time. So, Matt, I'm going to take your question, and then we have to write them down, and then we'll ask them at the end. Is it 10:30? They both need to leave. So ask yours, and then we'll write questions down okay. for the end. Do do those the things that you have up there take into account the negatives and the positives, and it still comes out a net positive? You spoke before about you know there's a slower <laughs> wage growth in other in other side or there may be decreased hours and you've looked at that and said that in the end it's still a net positive to the state revenues. Okay, I, have, I, I haven't said anything about that yet. I have been very quiet about what the net positive effect is. So we're going to get there. But you just had one that said there's Yeah, oh, the state revenues, revenues are absolutely positive. Absolutely okay. positive. Yeah. Okay. And, and okay. So, so here on this very slide is the net fiscal gain to the state's budget from increased tax revenues and decreased benefit payments. Okay, so if we separate out those two effects, increased revenues and decreased benefit payments, we see an, a gain to the state of about 150,000 in um, uh, fiscal year 2019. That includes only six months of an increase in the minimum wage because it starts January 1st, 2019. In 2020, the effect is about $2 million to the, to the positive. In 2018, and I'm talking today's dollars, okay? Um, so, positive effects there. And about 40, 42% of the net fiscal gain comes from higher revenues. Just in your mind, you can think 40% higher revenues, 60% decreased benefit costs. Okay, um, so, okay, so, so, decreased benefit costs include lots of these programs that Deb's gonna talk about, so we'll jump over that for now. Okay, increased wages paid by the state. Uh, we think on average about 600,000 more for the state to pay out on average FY 2019 to 2024. And it's smaller in the earlier years as the minimum wage is ramping up, larger in the later years. And that does include both pay as well as Social Security, Medicare, retirement contributions if relevant. Most of the costs come from temporary workers and they are not eligible for uh, retirement benefits. Um, I will just note that historically about 40% of the cost of the state workforce has been covered by federal or other funding sources and uncertainty about the federal budget says we don't know what will happen going forward. Okay, uh, the cost of state contracts could increase. We, we had to think hard about this, but there may be some agency of transportation contractors who pay the minimum wage, although most of their workers are covered by the Davis-Bacon Act Mm -hmm. which says that they are paid much higher than the minimum wage. That's a federal mm -hmm. rule. Um, we have employees at designated agencies and specialized service agencies that, because of a legislative change last year, are now all paid at $14 per hour. So some of them would have been affected, but now they're supposed to be all paid at $14 an hour. 
We have home health and personal care organizations such as the Visiting Nurse Association, and we, do, we have evidence that says, yes, there are absolutely minimum wage workers in those um, organizations. The problem there is that much of their reimbursement comes from the federal government, and that reimbursement does not change when the minimum wage mm -hmm. changes. It's a, it's a grant to the state, it's a lump sum, mm -hmm. and so the question is what would happen? Would they hire fewer workers, meaning they are able to offer fewer uh, services? Um, would they cut the, the hours of all the workers they have? Um, that is a, just pay the extra? I mean, but the state could choose to pay the extra, absolutely. So that is a real area of concern. In public education, uh, pre-K through grade 12, schools, we looked at Addison Northwest near Middlebury, and we looked at North Country Supervisory Union, which is Northeast Kingdom, and both of those examples say that the increase paid to people like um, paraeducators and cafeteria workers and so forth would be less than 0.1% of their budget on average. So, uh, you know, some impact, but not, not terribly large. We looked at UVM and Vermont State Colleges, and again, it looks like a, a relatively small effect, about 75,000 on average, or about 60,000 on average for um, the usual kind of workers you think of at, at the universities. But if you think about federal work-study students, there could be an effect there. Again, the federal work-study money comes in as a lump. So would they cut back on hours? Would they cut back on the number of students who are eligible? Yeah, just quickly on that. All right, Bob. Just very quickly. <laughs> so that's based on 1350 or the whole 15? That is based on the path leading up to 15. Well, so, where, does, where do you get, for Vermont State Colleges, where do you get 60? From? So that's an where average. That's an average this. over the six years. Okay. So it would be less at the beginning, more at the end. Okay, uh, we looked at whether there would be an effect on the state employees' retirement and Vermont State teachers' retirement funds. You would think higher wages could mean higher liabilities, but in fact, the way the benefits work, it's often the, the last three years of, of high-paid work that matters for the, for the benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also true that the temporary employees don't get the retirement benefits. So it looks like not very much of an impact there. Um, where we do see an effect is changes in eligibility for the other programs. So that's debt, and we're going to get there. Okay, so overall economic effects. Um, as we mentioned, some minimum wage workers work fewer hours or lose their jobs. We're estimating in calendar year 2019 about 200 fewer jobs. In calendar year 2020, about 350 fewer jobs. So think about the economy chugging forward under the current minimum wage path. And then think of the economy moving forward under the S-40 minimum wage path. And what's the difference in the number of jobs in a year? So we're saying that in calendar year 2020, you would see about 350 fewer jobs under the higher minimum wage. Okay. Um, now, if we think about the long term, after we've moved up to 15 and, and things move forward over time, the rough estimate says about 2,250 fewer jobs each year on average in the very long term, 2028 to 2040. Decreasing each year. Nope. This says think of the number of jobs under the current path and think of the number of jobs in the economy. Yeah, so it's just a, a, a drop down. Right. 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 Not, not lost annually. Right. It says each year on average. It says each year. Yeah, well, so I wanted, uh, this has been very confusing for many people, and I, I just wanted to say this is each year, think about the average number of jobs. Spread. Yeah. Okay? No. No. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a slow learner. Okay, that's all right. Suppose we have, I'm going to guess, something like 350,000 jobs in Vermont under current law, chugging forward over time. This says that, that instead of 350,000, we would have 347,750 jobs on average in each year. The difference okay? would stay so the, the same So the difference over time. stays the same once you get it out into the, from this one effect. Of course, zillions of other things are happening. Okay. 
Um, let's see, so it is true that during expansionary years, more people might be induced, they would be attracted to enter the labor force. Um, so that's a good thing. It's also true that fewer federal funds coming to Vermont would have a, a negative effect um, because eligibility for federal benefits would also drop. So think of the federal money as sort of free money from heaven, right? And that path, that flow, would be shut off a little bit because fewer people would qualify for federal programs. So that actually ends up hurting us. It's also true that higher federal, now of course you can think in your mind, we don't want these people to be on the federal programs, and I agree, but this is just the result. Okay, and we also have higher federal tax liability for some people who are earning higher wages and would have to pay higher federal income tax, right? And again, that's money that goes out of the state, uh, so that's a, a negative effect for our state's economy. So on average, the modeling says that Vermont GDP would, would be lower by about 0.3% in the long run. So again, think of all that gets produced in Vermont over time under the current path and think of what would be produced under the new path with the lower minimum wage and the, the delta, the change, is 0.3%. So it's tiny, but it is a tiny negative effect. Okay? All right, now this is the big table and we can go through this. We've talked about all of these effects. We can talk about specific ones or just go through the table. Uh, it's up to you. I think we can read through this on our own. Uh, I want to give Deb plenty of time yes. to talk about Yes, and I do want to emphasize when you look at the share of jobs and the number of jobs, this is jobs, not people, because we collect data from employers on um, how many workers do you have and what are they earning. So we know the number of jobs very well in Vermont. It's harder to get the data on specific workers. Right. That's the 350 number. This is all 18 numbers. Uh, 2018 dollars, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. All right, we will. Are we good on that one? On this one we... Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, and here's my last last slide. So here's the picture of the long-term economic effects. We have net annual long-term disemployment. That means fewer jobs <coughs> by the 2002-50 that I talked about. Um, as a share of total jobs, that's 0.5%, so a very small percentage. As a share of minimum wage jobs, it's a loss of about 3.3% of minimum wage jobs, okay? Which again is not huge, but it, for some people it would be meaningful. Um, and the effect, overall effect on Vermont GDP, minus 0.3%, okay? Good, thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. <coughs> Are you gonna address the cost to us? Hmm. So that's, so remember it's overall a positive, that, that's the net fiscal impact, that overall is a positive. That was in this. Yeah, but I mean as far as state government. State government. So that's all wrapped up into the, the net fiscal gain. So there's a gain from revenues, there's a loss from paying a little bit more to employees, and there's a loss. Uh, uh, there's a gain to fewer benefits. All that's wrapped up into the net fiscal gain. Yes. Um, we have okay. uh, Peter and Dave, and we, ha we need to oh. stop at 10 after so that Deb <laughs> okay. can get started. So Joyce, looking at this slide specifically, the gain to the state from increased revenue and decreased payments is $20 million, but then the loss uh, of federal funds to the state economy from, from reduction of benefits is $54 million, or a net loss well, well, $34 million. So remember, the first line is just the state's budget. Just the state's budget, right? And the second line is to the whole state's economy. So think of all the people in the state, and some of them will get less, okay. less fewer benefits. Gotcha. Yes. So it's not comparing. Not, it's not. Gotcha. Thank you. Dave? Three quick things. Maybe we can do it offline, but um, uh, trying to determine the cost on the state budget, not by the cost of what lower state employees are paying. Um, nursing homes state regulations say whenever there's a state mandate 
the state shall absorb that cost on them. Mm, I wanted yeah. to touch base with you to see if you did any modeling on what their current wages are with division of rate setting to see if there is an increase to us. The second area for you to, to uh, focus on, I know you reached out to Eris and I think you got some information. It's important, I think, for all of us to remember um, there are many, many people who do the work of the designated agencies who are not employed by the designated agencies, who aren't in that mix of $14 an hour. They're more minimum wage folks doing the personal care or, or um, day support services for the 3,500 people on the DS waiver that we uh, heard about. And the same thing, there's a significant number in the Choices for Care program mm -hmm. also that spills over into the VNA. And um, then finally, um, in the child care world, I, I'm less concerned, uh, I'm concerned very much about the whole benefits cliff, but I'm worried about the, the market rate gap. There's one now, and I think in order to close it, it's like 50, no. it's a lot of money to get to more current market rates. If child care centers have to increase their rates to pay their help, their costs to the consumers go up and, and our subsidy program, aside from eligibility, buys even less. Absolutely. And, and I'm concerned about a dollar amount. What would it cost if we tried to absorb some of that cost mm -hmm. for those employers? So those are just three cost areas. By law, I don't think we're, other than the nursing homes, I'm not sure we're required <coughs> to do anything, but we should at least know it's going to be shifted to somebody. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And and we've thought carefully about all three areas. So I'm going to punt the child care to Deb because she's definitely yes. addressing that. We looked very carefully at the distribution of wages in the VNAs. We, we worked carefully with the executive director to, to collect data from all the 14 VNAs around the state and to look at the exact wages so paid you know to the people. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the way the data were collected, I was not able to play with the spreadsheet, and so the data came in in a way such that the executive director couldn't quite put everything together. We tried very hard, I can tell you that. Okay. Um, so I don't have a number for you. I do know that it's a very big concern for uh, VNAs, for uh, home health aides, and so forth. Okay. Absolutely. And the same is true for the folks at the DAs and mm -hmm. the Choices for Care and so mm -hmm. forth. There are many workers who will be affected, and where the money's going to come from is not clear. So those are absolutely areas for concern. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much. Deb, I think you're here. Thanks. This is also a middle tap. This is also a middle tap. It looks like there you go. Thanks. So, for the record, I'm Deb Brighton, and consultant to the Joint Fiscal Office, and I'm trying to look at the relationship between the change in the minimum wage and benefits. So, I'm going to try to whip through this and concentrate only on the ones that mm -hmm. are immediately affected, but um, Representative Yacovoni will understand this. This came from, we started doing this when he was a commissioner. Um, but this is looking at the relationship between wages and the other benefits that people get to help them make ends meet. And so across here you have gross earnings increasing from zero all the way up to $82,500. Um, and then the blue bar going up is your net earnings, net of taxes. And then all the other little colors added to that bar are the benefits that you may be able to get. Um, public benefits to help you make ends meet. And then this line across here is comes from the basic needs study um, that Joyce was talking about. It's what this household, in this case it's a single person, would need to meet their basic needs. And so you can see when they're below, um, below this level, we're chipping in to a certain extent with a variety of benefits. As people's net earnings increase, they're better able to pick up a share on their own, and the benefits decrease. So that means that people are on their way up in terms of making ends meet, and it also means that government is saving money on the benefits because they're using less and less and less. Clarification question? Yeah. Uh-oh. Um, so is this, 
is this when you're when you're talking about the benefits? Is this counting sort of the cash value of that, or the actual impact to Vermonters of receiving that? So, for example, if you're receiving the benefit, a Medicaid benefit. Right. You're not receiving a cash value for that, but if you go into the exchange system, what you're actually seeing and paying looks totally different. That, that's right. So I had to, um, most of them, they have a dollar value. <clears throat> you know, like say food stamps or child care subsidy, they have a dollar value. Um, something like health care, I had to value Medicaid um, and also the cost sharing and the out of pocket expenses. I had to turn them into a dollar. Okay. To put them in so if it's a direct dollar for to dollar the, system to the person to the person it's accounted like that and if it's something that's more intangible you had to value it okay yes. thank you um, so anyway this is what you want to see as people um, have a work incentive essentially as they earn more they get farther ahead and um, we save in terms of benefits this is what you don't want to see. This is another household. Um, <clears throat> this is a family with two children, or a single parent with two children. They're age four and six, and so one needs after-school care, mm -hmm. and the other needs um, full-time care, basically. And so what you see is, to a certain extent, um, the benefits are fairly steady. And up to about here, there's an incentive to keep working. And then at a certain point, the more you earn, the worse mm -hmm. off you are. You have fewer benefits and you're not able to meet your basic needs. And so essentially, if you go from 20, earning $25,000 a year to $45,000 a year in this family, mm -hmm. your um, net resources would decrease by $7,500. And so it's not a cliff. Um, we've been calling it a benefit cliff. But it sort of functions that way because at a certain point you go, if I take that raise, if I work an extra hour, I lose childcare. And to me, that's a cliff. I can't do it. So people don't want to do that. Um, but the problem is with the minimum wage, we might actually be sort of pushing people off the cliff. Well, down the slope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not Did I say that alone? I'm sorry. <laughs> right. And so, um, let's see, most of these benefits that you see were designed as sort of a safety net. And so they were supposed to be maximum up to 100% of federal poverty level. And then when you hit federal poverty level, they would decline. Um, and you know, the theory was that you're out of poverty now so that you know, they can decline. The problem is that the federal poverty level is quite low um, compared to the basic needs budget. So in this case, the federal poverty level is here. This is two times the federal poverty level, or 200%, and that's 300%. And so you can see the benefits start cutting out at around 100% of federal poverty level. People still can't meet their basic needs. And they all cut out at about the same time, between 100% and 200% um, of federal poverty level. Even the ones, like the earned income tax credit, that aren't pegged to federal poverty level, they just sort of phase out at the same point. And so I can quickly explain the ones that they, the big ones that they are. And the first one, the blue one, is uh, SNAP, three squares. Um, and so that starts declining. It finally phases out at 185% of federal poverty level. But when you're on the downslope, for every additional dollar you earn, you're losing 24 cents in food stamps. Um, the earned income tax credit is this pink one, and then it's also, we pegged to it, um, we provide 32% of it, and so that's the purple one on the top, and that's also phasing out in the same area. Um, the, the brick colored one is what I, sort of the public in health insurance. It includes Medicaid, and then it moves the people onto the exchange, and that declines um, because the parents move off of Medicaid at 138% of federal poverty level, and then the kids stay on with Dr. Dinosaur much higher, so the, not in this range, but the parent moves off. And <clears throat> then that means that you're picking up more, even though you move on to the exchange, as you move up in income, you pick up more of the um, premium and the cost sharing. 
Um, just to give you uh, my little small way of thinking. So as opposed to $400 a week, how much, what does that do for you when you're making $600 a week instead? Because that's what we'll have. You get me? I mean, where's poverty level? on a weekly basis. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm way ahead of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, so you can see here that federal poverty level, first of all, that it varies by household size, and then you can also compare it to the minimum wage. Okay, and, and you can see that both federal poverty level and the minimum wage will end up if you're full time working or still less than what the legislature determines as your meeting your basic needs. So um, you don't have to go back to the other slide, but when you go there, the black part, nobody along this continuum towards the 70,000 is your basic needs budget until you get. Yeah. Well, of course, not because the numbers don't get. So even with all of their supports, it, it doesn't it doesn't come close. Right. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but so looking at the list of supports, oh, another one is the um, fuel assistance, which is the yellow. Yeah. Um, that also fades out, and that also fades out around 185 percent of federal poverty level. So all of those ones that I mentioned. Um, apply equally to all types of families, and they all phase out. The main reason that this family here is different and is going down, has this down slope, rather than um, making some gain for every dollar earned, is this green one on top. It's child care. And this is the child care financial assistance <laughs> program. And, and so, when the summer study committee looked at, had to look at the minimum wage and the benefit clause and tried to mm -hmm. figure out how to keep from shoving people over the, what we're calling a slope, the edge, <laughs> the edge whatever, um, decided to concentrate on that program because that would be the most direct way to de deal with this, even though we could have tried to deal with all of the other programs too, because it's a cumulative effect, really. So um, how much would it cost the state to fill in that hole? Is there a chart that tells us the amount that we would have to address to fill in the slope? Well, we haven't done this since a study um, with Representative Iacovoni maybe five years ago, where what we tried to say was, what if we wanted not just to fill it in flat, but to give some incentive to say, for every dollar earned, you, you would at least keep 25 cents? Um, and it was around, it was over $70 million at that time. So, yeah. so went on to other issues. <laughs> it didn't go very far. It didn't go far. Um, and so we didn't, at this time, we didn't even bother to redo that calculation. We decided to focus on, um, it's, I think what it's been called now is that um, just do no harm. You know, to see what we can do just to make sure that the minimum wage is a benefit rather than a problem to people. Um, so the way this program works is um, there, like most programs, benefit programs, you first figure out what the need is um, and what that would cost to meet that need. So like for food stamps, they, they have this thrifty food budget and they you know, figure out what that cost is. Um, for child care, um, people always ask, what is the cost, the total cost? And there are, I think, 120 possible total costs that depend on the age of the child, um, whether it's full-time, part-time, extended care, and then the, um, these are the star ratings, the quality ratings. Mm -hmm. But if you just look at, say, an infant full-time, three stars, the maximum subsidy would be um, that the state would provide would be one hundred and eighty dollars and forty three cents a week. The so second that's not part, the cost. I'm sorry, that's not the cost. That's just that would be our subsidy. subsidy. Well, the subsidy is based on a market rate, and 
So, but it's based on a market rate, and then, um, but then they have to get an appropriation. So it's based on the market rate subject to the appropriation. So they're out of date, as you heard before. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second piece of all of the programs is figuring out how much the public pays and how much the family pays. And it, usually it's based on income. And so in this case, uh, it's based on income as a percentage of federal poverty level. And so across the bottom, you see increasing income. And then the, this is the percent of that maximum amount that you would get. So in the case that we just looked up, it's $180 a week. And so somebody at 100% of federal poverty level would get 100% of that subsidy. And then as you go up to, say, 150% of the federal poverty level, you will get 60% of that. In other words, as your income increases, your subsidy percentage more decreases. decreases. You're, yeah, you're getting less. So this is an example of um, somebody starting at, if their income were $23,000 a year, and it increased by 2.75%. Um, and I chose that amount because that's sort of in, in um, 2018 dollars, the first step increase. Okay. So with, um, the, with the Senate bill, this reflects the impact of the Senate bill. Yeah, the first, the first step. The first step. So the, um, at 23,000, that would be current law, they'd get 95 percent of that maximum amount, the maximum amount being $180. So they would get 171 a week and 8,913 in a year. Under this bill, instead of being 23,000, their income would be 23, it's 633. So they'd only get 90 percent under current law. So 90 percent of 180 is 162 dollars that they get. It ends up being 8,444 for the year. So they got an increase of income of $633, and they got a decrease in their child care of 469. So all alone, they'd still come out a little bit ahead, but the problem is they've also lost all those other things. So it looks more like this. If you figure out all the other things that they lost, it turns out the income goes up $633, and they would have lost $765. So, so right. So the but why take the rate? You know. So the idea would be to just change that sliding scale, move it over by the same percentage. Two point seven five. You, you change the scale by 2.75%? Yes, exactly. To exactly. compensate for the So money. now, right. somebody at 100%, their income went up 10%, so they're at 110, and they're still going to get 100%. And at 150%, their income now goes up to 160%, and they're still going to get the same amount that they got before. Yeah, yes. But you'd have to do that every year. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, that so that's what we're not good at doing. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're still back. We haven't been able to even come into this decade with the market rates. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> let's see. Child care is really a crisis right now. Yeah. It's a problem, um, whether you're getting the subsidy or not. Mm -hmm. And this isn't solving all that problem. We knew that was, uh, I think you're out of the room, we knew that was too expensive to, to get rid of that dip. So this is just trying to protect. What is the cost per year to shift that over? Okay, I'll get that in just half a second. Oh, I, just, I just wanted to add this column in. If you made that change, then instead of, um, you still have, you're still earning $633 more, but instead of having your loss and benefits exceeding that at 765 now you're only losing 436. So okay. So you're still you're not getting rich, but you're you're not going back. You're not going back. Okay. This this is the es estimate of the cost, and I, I realize this is incredibly confusing, but this is 2018 dollars. Okay. So these numbers down here on minimum wage don't match choices because they are fifteen dollars is actually twelve dollars and ninety five. These are twenty eighteen. Okay. This is the same as fifteen and twenty twenty four. Is this enough? Okay. And we did all of our modeling um, in twenty frozen dollars, twenty eighteen dollars essentially. So 
This is taking some of that state gain that we get from the increase in income tax and the decrease in other um, sorts of benefits, particularly the earned income tax credit um, as people move up, and then comparing that with the estimate of what we think making that change, that change every year would cost. So in other words, in the first year, it would add a million dollars to the cost of CCFAP, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. And then compared to current current law. Just to keep it at eighteen dollars. Yes, in twenty eighteen dollars, you're correct. And then in the second year, um, it would cost two million over current law. So not one plus two, but just two. That's correct. Just two. one plus one. Yes. <laughs> I was thinking was so in the first year I, I think that um, that they're, the, they're looking at this amount in the budget it would not be covered in our best estimate by the gain by the, you would get in the first year right but in subsequent years it would be it would I'm be that sign. <laughs> I'm sorry, that last statement. In the first year, it wouldn't be covered. In the second year, and for subsequent years, it would it be does, covered yeah. so that the it would go to column two. Then that's after the coverage is taken into account, in or you're assuming that the entire cost would be covered entirely by the increased revenue. Right. right. We, we get this much revenue that we could use. And we only budget. really need 8.5 of it for that particular gotcha. purpose. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sorry. That Look was that. Wrap it up. Right time. No, that was really good. <laughs> that, I mean, that was a lot. Of, a lot. Of oh yeah. Yeah. Good lord. Yeah. So we can so double all of the information that they missed. All of the dollars are in 18. Yes. But. So I could add one and one, and then I can't do any more than that. So as we move, are we freezing everybody into 18 rates? And the answer is no. By the time we get to 2024, we're not going to be saying, oh, we're six years. You know, we should yeah. have been inflating six. We should have been increasing the amount we're putting in. Right. These All of these current. numbers would actually all the numbers in this chart would actually increase with inflation. Right. Um, and so this is like constant dollars, meaning that yeah. you know, okay. taking the inflation out. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, the point that I think Representative Yankovone brought up was that our, um, our pay scale are, is out of date currently. This doesn't bring us up to that. It does oh, include... This, keeps, this, this has keeps you at 2024, you're still going off the $18. 20. No. no. Oh, not oh, the $18. This is the 2007 or right. 6 exactly. There's no change. In 2024. No change. With this that is that just taking what we do now. So the, the yeah. market um, rate now that right. there is estimated mm -hmm. being, that needing $9.1 right. million dollars to fill it in. And this doesn't do that. It does, however, include um, a, an increase in um, pay. That, in other words, increase in pay of child care providers. Because if, as the minimum wage goes up, food, yeah. people either below, well, not below, at or slightly above mm -hmm. the what ends up being $15 an hour. Um, so they they would get an increase. Now, I don't understand how you do that without adjusting the market yeah. rate. What's the mechanism to to do that? Because the way you handle the minimum wage typically is that you have, you know, they, they assume the, because right. it's a private entity, they're going to be doing the minimum wage as part of the market rate. So I'm just a little yeah. confused. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the way that we did it was to, um, we don't have actual data of um, all of the child care providers, but we did three separate methods, different ways, and they actually came together pretty well. So we just then took that percentage increase to the current market rates. Okay. No, actually, I'm sorry. I, I took that percentage on top of if you brought them all the way up 
Um, so right. It, it does, all the way up the if, you, if you had the first inflated them up to added the 9.1 million, okay. then I went and calculated what the um, increase would be. So these numbers then are based on the market rates being current as of this date and moving forward. So this is bring, these numbers bring us current with the. Is it? They, they no, can't. they're taking our out of date payment schedule, uh -huh. and it only inflates with inflation. That's it, the increase that we get. Okay. Okay, and then it's adding on top of that the cost of um, moving. Moving the. Right, increasing the, the So it's increasing the pay scale, um, but not the whole payment schedule. Okay, so it's. No, Matt, pretty much back to the day and the night. Well, I, I probably, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm, I'm struck by the possibility that all of the unknown, untold consequences of the minimum wage on all of the economy um, yields. When you're all said and done, yields to me, not to the person making twenty-three thousand, you know, a couple hundred dollar net gain. Not even. Yeah. And, and and in the end, and this is the part maybe I shouldn't say, one might want to do an analysis and say, just take the state share, the EIT EITC, yeah. and plow it into child care, and the, the benefits for some of the lowest uh, lowest income Vermont folks with children, you might get a better, uh, I, I'm almost confident you'd get a far better return than trying, than this, just because of all the complexities and mm -hmm. how things come and go. Um, Yet I know that's controversial, but uh, it almost like one might want to look at it. Yeah. So Deb, I know you need to go, and I'm, I'm going to ask a question that you won't be able to answer now, but I'd like, I'd like, I'd like <laughs> a male response to Teresa. What are all the assumptions that were made in putting this together, please? <laughs> wow, how do you know? Yeah, I'm glad you don't want to get into it right now. So, uh, and, and what's the riskiest? If you just let us know, what are the riskiest assumptions that you've made? And put um, in this okay. That would be very helpful. So let's see. Um, the, the biggest, un no, I, di I did have actual people participating sure. and could figure out that, and then I could use the census data to match them up with how many more people there are working. Um, with working parents needing childcare of different ages. Um, and, but then the big unknown is, what are they doing? Um, they're not, you know, they're not in this program. They can't afford childcare. What are they doing? Um, <clears throat> we don't really know that. And uh, there is a discussion of a, provi of a, a demand study that mm -hmm. is gonna be done, hopefully. Uh, the money isn't quite together. It would be really helpful. Um, so it, it just means it's hard to know. You know how many people are eligible. You know how many people are taking advantage of this program now. You know how many people should have that need. But we don't know what they're doing and what would, what would um, make them come into the program. A lot of it is that the subsidy is just too low for them to be able to go to those programs. But where are the kids? Right. I'm, you know, I'm one. I'm the grandma here. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So, and, and I find myself asking about fifteen dollar in the end of all this, the fifteen dollar an hour I call it staying power, the ability to make somebody happy with fifteen dollars an hour. Now I know businesses that start at twelve and thirteen and move them up to fifteen. And these guys just come and go like it, it doesn't mean, seem to do a lot of good in some arenas. Right. So I'm wondering if it doesn't make people stick, it brings them up out of poverty somewhat, but it doesn't make them stay there and all is lost, or a lot can be lost yeah. and, and fall back <laughs> onto where it was and we start all over again. Okay? Yeah. I. I don't, I, you I mean, know, you're I know. with human nature here. $15 an hour and you're, you're still not making it particularly if you have kids. I've seen it not um, for three dollars an hour. Yeah. I mean these are thirty years old, thirty five year olds that, that have some experience and stuff. And then just all of a sudden one day just decide, oh, no particular problem, I just gotta do something different. 
I don't know how to answer to that one. But it's out there. I don't I, know how much it is. In the industry that I'm more familiar with right now, you see quite a bit of it. But, so, Deb, I think that's a perfect place to end up this. Uh, <laughs> and I say that only because we've got somebody outside. I know, yeah. So, thank you. I, thank I you. think you need to go <laughs> so Thank you so very much for coming in. We thank both you. appreciate it. So thank good you. to see you. Thanks nice to see you. Oh, I'm still at it. Yes. Thanks, Deb. 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 It'll, it, no, it'll, it'll just rec it's recording. Okay. Good morning. Good so morning. We, we've lost a couple members to the Senate. Okay. They didn't <laughs> get, get, get elected over there. They've been, I didn't know they've that. been asked to come down <laughs> to do a presentation. So. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and the rest of us may go in and out. We have okay. this morning. So. Okay. So it's not that we're boring you. No, no, no. I mean, there's, there's good news here. So. Excellent. Well, thank you for having us. I'm Rebecca White. I'm the Director of Risk Management Operations in the Agency of Administration. I'm Bradley Kuchenberger. I'm the Financial Director for the Risk Management Programs in the Agency of Administration. And he's not talking from the sidelines. Yeah. No, and, uh, yeah. It looks different from the sidelines. I almost chose to sit over there. Just feel a little more comfortable. Yeah, but then I invited him over, and so we kind of I can say no. But, um, we, I, we were talking about, um, you know, you were looking for, as we understand it, just a presentation kind of of what we have done, and um, Rebecca's uh, worked probably most directly mm -hmm. and if not daily or hourly mm -hmm. with um, the third party administrator PMA um, companies of New England who we hired in uh, 2017 in the fall. And so they've been working for a year putting their programs in place. And so we thought we 16 actually. Oh, fall 16, 16, excuse yeah. me. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we'd do kind of an overview of what we've done and um, where we are at this point, and then we would talk a little bit about um, the financial impact of that as well. And I think we're open to questions mm -hmm. or interruptions sure. at any time. Yeah, for sure. Great. So we um, put out a request for proposal for a third party administrator to handle the workers' compensation, workplace safety, and liability claims for the state of Vermont. The state, as you may already know, is self-insured, so it's our money. We have an excess liability policy over 500000 that covers liability type of claims, which is different from the workers' compensation. But the PMA folks handle the actual claims. We have a lot of say in the matter and how the claims are handled, obviously according to statute, because it's our money, basically. It's the state's money. Um, because with some insurance companies, in some companies, if they just buy an insurance policy and they have the folks who handle the policy handle the claims, uh, the client has much less say in the matter of how claims are handled. So we have a lot of say in the matter, which is great. So we uh, chose through a committee, uh, PMA companies, for a two-year contract starting in August 2016 through August 2018 with two one-year renewals. And after that point, we will go out to bid again. Um, they were the lowest cost and the best um, content proposer that we had. We had about maybe six others, I believe. So we had a pretty you know, good response. And PMA handles uh, workers' compensation claims. So basically they have about five adjusters, a workers' comp manager, and a supervisor who um, work in their home offices and, or their office, not home office, but their office at PMA. And they uh, get claims in uh, online. Our folks, our supervisors and managers would work with the injured worker to file the claim online. PMA gets the claim. Right away, they contact the injured worker. 
the manager and get the medical records and contact the medical provider. If it's something that's serious, you know, such as a head injury, concussion, you know, what, anything like that, they would assign a nurse case manager and make sure that the claim is uh, reviewed right away to see what happened and how can we prevent it from happening again. In terms of the liability claims, it's the same type of process. It's this um, report the claims to risk management. We report them online to PMA. And then the PMA adjuster calls the uh, injured party right away, gets their statement, calls someone at the state of Vermont. We gave them a list of contacts, such as in human resources, to talk about what happened. Usually with the liability claims, it's things like uh, auto accidents, if we hit someone as we're driving in our state car or truck, or it could be an employment matter. Anything like that in a more serious matter is handled by the Attorney General's office, and PMA just does the like paperwork, basically. Bob, let me back up a little bit. Do you get a better rate because of the numbers of, of employees, or, um, or why, why are you obviously looking for a rate by doing this? And uh -huh. I just think we saw in the budget this year. Mm -hmm that reflected. Mm -hmm. So that must be why you're going out and subcontracting it. The rate was, well, basically we did an RFP. So we gave the information out there to companies who were qualified to uh, send us a proposal. And it was based upon number of employees we have, our claim history. So right. we issued that to you know, obviously without having the names or any personal information so that these folks could could give us a rate. And um, it, it was actually, the rates that we got were for the claims handling, the administration, their IT system, that type of a thing, the medical case uh, management, and we're paying the claims on our own now. So it's, you know, it's just the admin cost. That's the rate. Oh, it's okay. not like an insurance company where it's a mod type of a thing where if you're a roofing company it's going to be very high versus an office company where it's right. not high because there's not much exposure there. All right. Yes. Thank you. So I was getting confused because I thought we were talking about workers' compensation, uh -huh. but you were talking about liability claims. Uh -huh. So is PMA handling all of our insurances for us, so liability as well as, mm -hmm. I don't know what else, and workers' comp? Mm -hmm. The PMA is, because risk management used to handle that, workers' compensation, which means state employees who are injured on the job, right. liability claims also, risk management have been handling that, and those are claims where a state employee has... Um, you know, hurt someone yeah, else, right. yeah. car accident, or if a um, a state employee may say they were uh, unlawfully terminated, that type of employment sure. matters. They also handle workplace safety, which is so. I'm just saying what the contract is, but we can focus on workers' comp for sure. Okay. I just thought I, and then we do have a few other uh, contractors that handle claims such as there's an ARIS program for um, home health care workers through DAHS, Sentry Insurance handles that. So we have a, a few other smaller programs, but this is our biggest one. So when you said you had five adjusters who were handling your insurance claims, yeah. I assumed you meant you had five adjusters who were handling your workers' comp claims, but that's not the case. No, it is for work. No, the liability, we have two adjusters and a manager. And for the workers' comp, it's, it's five. Okay. Five or six. Okay. I'd have to get that exact number. So, I mean, traditionally, workers' comp is handled as a separate book of business from, I mean, you may have the same insurance yes. insurer mm -hmm. managing it, mm -hmm. but it's a different book of business. Mm -hmm. Is that the case here? Or if 
feels like they're getting kind of blended together. Well, they're, um, they're accounted for separately. They're two distinct programs. Um, and they just happen to be managed. The contract we have with PMA supplies mm -hmm. <coughs> claims adjusting for both the workers' comp program mm -hmm. and the general liability program. Okay. When, um, uh, and that is how it was done previously. We had um, state employees who worked on workers' comp, and we had state employees who worked on liability mm -hmm. as well. But they are separated completely. Yeah. 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 I mean, we have one okay. big okay. manager that he, you know, oversees they, both. Okay. But yeah. They're they have separate, separate appropriations and separate mm -hmm. financial statements mm -hmm. and separate okay. accounts mm -hmm. and all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, ahead, Peter, keep, I'm keep not going. sure where we are. Just at the beginning. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and also what PMA handles is workplace safety, and they've done a wonderful job with that because we have uh, a senior uh, safety person who has been working with... Uh, Department of Environmental Conservation on um, confined space entry and dams. So DEC has been really happy about that. We have another person who's who just does ergonomic assessments because we have a great need for that. And he's done about 600 so far, and you know since August of 2016. So it's. Uh, a lot of people want those and need them for their to make their workplace a little bit more comfortable. And you are all welcome as well because you know. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we don't want to touch that, but you know we, it's important so you don't have say a hurt um, you know neck or shoulder or whatever just by in typing all the time and good light and stuff. So they're great with that. So that's another need that was done. They're also helping us with our OSHA 300 logs with statutory reporting. So they've been a, a very big help in terms of uh, beefing up risk management and workers' comp and making sure that we... When you say they, you mean PMA? PMA, yes, okay. yes. Um, helping us uh, conform to statutory requirements and exceeding them and meeting best practices. So um, we every year we have a, an independent uh, claims audit of the workers' compensation and liability claims program. Mm -hmm. And this, this, again, was put out to bid years ago, and we renewed the contract with this person. He's, he has a lot of experience in um, just reviewing claims independently for various companies. And he gave us our review a few months ago, and we passed with flying colors. And it was interesting because it was now this was how how is PMA doing the job? And they said that we can they conformed with best practices in you know practically every category. So it was a big improvement from the year before. So that was a good thing. And our contract has performance reviews. So that's what been. What does that mean for the state, though? What? That, that we have a vendor that's not just uh, saving money, but that they're doing a really good job. Because that's important. I mean, it's not just about money. We want to make sure that the employees are well taken care of. Because and those are the best practices that you've been mm -hmm. talking about. Best practices means calling the employee right after they get injured, um, handling uh, catastrophic claims with a nurse, mm -hmm. you know, so that the person knows what to do type of a thing. Uh, light duty, we've instituted that at many um, of our facilities, such as corrections. They're a big proponent of it. Yes. And I, I came in late, and so I apologize. Yeah, for that's this, okay. So if I missed something. So is this information also coming from the point of view of the employee as well? I mean, do they do a, a survey with the, the employee about uh, working conditions being better, and you say there's less risk and and best practices uh -huh. are being used, those are maybe from, you know, more of a company point of view, uh -huh. but do we get the point of view from the employee as well saying, my workspace is better, I, uh -huh. I feel that my, you know, standing is better than uh -huh. sitting all day. Uh -huh. Are we getting the employee, is there some kind of employee survey or... I would you say, you know trying to yes, say? Okay. well, with the claims audit, he was an independent person that did this audit, so mm -hmm. he was looking at the claim system mm -hmm. that would have employee remarks, okay. you know, it was kind of like a running um, tally of every time the adjuster would contact the employee and what was going on with that. 
So it was that, and it was also we have our um, annual DHR uh, survey to employees, and that I think that talks about workplace safety. Chris McConnell's here, but you know that that I believe talks about it as well. And also, folks who uh, we should do. A, I, I think that we should do like a Survey Monkey survey to people on workers' comp or after having their ergos, because I've just heard anecdotal anecdotal information from people. Beth? How yes. do those outside audits compare to what they look like when they were state employees doing this work? It is uh, much better. They found, he looked at, uh, Gary Jennings looked at about maybe 19 categories. Yeah, of best practices. And this year for October 2017, he found that there was one or two parts where we didn't meet the best practice. Mm -hmm. The year before, it was more like seven or something. Yeah, seven. And we can supply that if you'd be interested in looking at the report. It, it's a good report. It's interesting. Keep going. Okay. Do you want it? Well, I was going to offer, you're doing a great job, oh, so you. I was just going to offer a suggestion of um, return to work and also yes. like claims reviews, which yes. are things that we've never really done before. Right, right. So basically, um, I came to the state of Vermont in January 2015. Prior to that, I had worked for the state of New Hampshire and Dutchess County, New York, uh, managing and kind of rolling out third-party administrative practices and, and just getting risk management departments more to where they need to be to help injured workers. Number one, we want to prevent claims. We don't want claims. But if they do happen, figure out how they cannot happen again and make sure that our employee is back to work, is doing well, is getting the treatment that they need, and not out there in limbo land type of a thing and unhappy and all that stuff. So what we've been doing in terms of better communication with the um, commissioners and their uh, directors and the managers of the folks that are on workers' comp is having claim reviews because prior to that uh, they weren't doing the claim reviews. Mm -hmm. So now we have every other week claim reviews with on the phone with folks that would call in. Mostly the veterans home is using it and uh, who, I mean that's a high risk job. Nurses taking care of folks who are in you know an institution. So they're very happy with us just finding out what's going on with their employee on workers' comp, when can they come back modified duty, you know, or can they come back at all, because those are um, heavy duty jobs. You have to lift at least 50 pounds, and many of the people working there are females, they're older, and they're, you know, dealing with, um, you know, vets, so it, it's not easy. So that's been a big help. And also, um, we've worked a lot with corrections on their um, claim reviews. So we have them in person and on the phone, just so that people get a sense of what's going on. We also send uh, reports to Human Resources every uh, other week, or every week, I think it is, on the claims and the status of the claims, so that they, you know, there's just better flow of communication. And I think it also connects the dots between having an, an injured worker, and I, we've heard um, before different commissioners, they would have an injured worker, and, and now maybe they'd have a vacancy or they'd fill the spot with temps, mm -hmm. but we're never really looped into the process of where is this claim, what's going on with it, what's the best way to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of integrates the leadership and management of departments with the workers' comp policy. It's not just that they get a bill every year and then have to manage with an injured worker or vacancy um, exactly. sporadically or in the dark. Right, because that's the big thing, and that is the biggest win-win for the employee, the manager, and financially is getting them back to work modified duty. Because in the past, folks will go to their doctor and the doctor say, just go back when you're ready. Well, that's, that's not good for the employee and it's not good for the uh, manager. 
because as Br uh, Bradley was saying, then they have to figure out, you know, either people are working overtime or they're hiring a temp or just morale goes down and all that stuff. So it's better to bring people back safely within their restrictions to come back to work so that they don't feel like they've been neglected or they don't know what's going on. You know, because many times I, I found that folks on workers' comp, they just kind of can get more depressed. They sit at home on TV, they watch the lawyer ads, and then forget it. <laughs> <laughs> then we're done. So if they're back and, you know, they're, they're with their peers, it, it's much better for them. And then they're focusing on ability, not disability. So that's the big thing that we're, we're plugging away at that. Yes. Uh, and I had to go to the bathroom for a minute. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. Um, but I, so I'm not sure if this is right. Um, but how is how is workers comp now getting along with folk rehab services in terms of somebody being able to see their own doctor? Ma you know, not making, but really requiring an injured employee to um, do the wellness part of recovery. Mm -hmm that sort of thing. How is that relationship working? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me a few years ago when I was on Commerce, mm -hmm. that seemed to, Commerce Committee, mm -hmm. that seemed to be a real problem. You mm -hmm. know, the interaction there mm -hmm. and the success. Mm -hmm. Well, voc rehab, vocational rehab is, um, it's mandated by the workers' comp rules for someone who is out on workers' comp 90 days or over that they, even though, and it is, it's a great rule because it does help people who perhaps they can never go back to their regular job if it's a you know moderate or heavy duty job, depending on their injury. Um, they can be retrained. They can go back to college even, or you know if they don't have a college degree, go to college, be retrained for a new position, or voc rehab can help them modify their position permanently because light duty, modified duty is meant to be temporary. It should really be up to three months at most. And then, because the person is, you know, in theory getting better, and then they should be able to go back to the regular job. But where does workers comp fit into that? Well, voc rehab, ha the voc rehab counselors that um, we use are, um, they need to report to the adjuster and to the Department of Labor every month. And they meet okay. with the employee. But they don't do the medical management part. That's a little bit different. That would be a nurse case manager that would either go with the employee to medical appointments, say if the doctor's being difficult and won't give them a, a release to return to work, or is maybe you know prescribing opioids, or is saying some sort of surgery that we're kind of like, why should they have that type of surgery? to advocate for the employee too because many times they can be in a situation where they'll just listen to the doctor like okay they're a doctor they know you know they know what's best and it's good to have someone sure. else there to talk to the doctor and kind of you know call them on things so um the medical case management is different from the voc rehab the voc rehab i think is wonderful but then they need to work closely with human resources in terms of if the person cannot go back to work, they need to work within the parameters of HR with the medical RIF process and all of that stuff and not overstep their bounds because sometimes they think that they know the things better than we do and that's not true. So, And the medical case management is huge um, because in Vermont we have a fee schedules for workers' comp. So basically, they can only charge a certain amount of money for a procedure, um, such as with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have a certain amount that they will pay. Um, but I think that most of the doctors are, go to workers' comp. They, they feel it's still lower, you know, because they, they complain that they don't make enough, that they have to have the volume. Um, so it, it's tough. I think it's tough, but our folks at PMA, they look at all the bills, they run them through a whole algorithm, I think it is, yeah. and they've saved quite a bit of money on that, like 42% through either double billing 
things that should not have gone through the workers' comp claim but did by accident, or they weren't in the prefer preferred provider network that we have, which is another thing that we didn't have in the past that we're working on now. Um, although it's kind of tough in Vermont because there aren't a ton of doctors. I mean, there's only so many. You know, there's UVM and a few others. So Mary, and then I have a question. Sure. So I think you just answered one of my questions, which is do you require an injured employee to see our, the, the department's doctors, or do you allow them to go see their own doctors? Well, per the workers' comp rules, the employee um, must see our doctor, quote unquote, just for the first visit. And if they want to see, say, their own doctor go somewhere else, they file a form with the Department of Labor and PMA, and it's always approved, and then they can see who they like. Okay, is, per the rules, so those are the rules that apply yeah. to any employee in any, the state of Vermont? It's every not employer, a particular no. To the state's no, contract? it's not. It, oh, it's it's yeah, per, it yeah, it's a workers' comp rule for all employers that uh, we have the right... I mean, maybe some employers don't invoke it, but they do have the right to have the employee go to, you know, our designated doctor. And I, I think that that has helped us just so employees aren't going to the emergency room, because many times they were, and that just is a huge waste of money and time. So it's better if they just go to, and, and the company doctors that we have set up, they're, you know, Concentra or Urgent Care. I mean, it's just those middle of the ground types of places, unless it's an emergency, of course, and then we'll go to the ETR. Yeah. yeah. So the question that I had, and you started down the road, it's, it goes to how much money, um, you mentioned we're saving 42%, mm -hmm. but can you quantify that in dollar amount and, mm -hmm. and from last year to this year? In other words, last year under the old system, first year under the new, and what can we expect in future years? Okay. Well, I think, um, I can start speaking to that more sure. generally, um, and then we'll we'll talk. I'm just gonna put that there. Okay. For, sure. uh, we can talk about the individual components, but I'm gonna pass out. Let's see. One, two. Although the 42 percent is on the medical case management. Right. Okay. So, so that's there's one different part variables. of it. Which I have the, and we're gonna leave this here. It's oh. our stewardship report that has all the numbers. In. Well, Bradley, put you something nice this. together. Pass it. Cool. Two pages. 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 If you send a couple down that way. Sorry, I have here's, here's a few more. <laughs> Careful, there's two pages. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> okay. Um, it's okay. I'll look. He's, he'll do the I have, I have plenty. Oh, you have an extra? Okay. I have some. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Does everyone have one? You would like one? Okay. So here is um, the first chart is just a quantification of our savings just on the operation side. So the cost of administering and claims handling. And what it is is a comparison of um, fiscal year 2016, which is the last full year that we had the uh, in-house state employees running the workers' compensation program, and compared to this year, which is the first full fiscal year. Um, and then I estimated the cost or projected the cost in the last three months. And so we have a comparison um, here. So um, the first or the biggest portion of savings comes from salaries and benefits. So when we moved to a third party administrator to PMA companies, we were able to reduce 10 positions, uh, which is six claims adjusters and four medical case managers. Um, I, the total savings that we're seeing in salaries and benefits is $620,000. I would like to point out that um, of those 10 positions, only six were filled at the time uh, that we made the transition. And um, 
all six of those employees were able to find employment um, in other places in state government. Um, there's also a reduction in overhead costs associated with these 10 fewer positions, which is the line below, which is a savings of about $128,000. The biggest portion of that being that we don't have to own and maintain our own risk management IT system. Um, we pay PMA a fee to use theirs, um, which is a big long-term savings because we don't have to upgrade it. We don't have to uh, pay for people to maintain it and service it. And um, PMA is, is always up to date and it's a kind of a, mm -hmm. a better system anyway. Mm -hmm. Corey has yeah, a but question. Sorry for having so many questions. Um, so, the, so the six employees who were then employed mm -hmm. found other jobs in state government. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the savings in salaries and benefits are to just workers' to comp state. unit, not to the state, not uh, to state old. government. When we look at no, it is. Well, well, it is because it is. Yeah. the positions that they would have gone to would have been budgeted for anyway. Um, oh, okay. We didn't add new positions. So it wasn't, an, it wasn't oh, okay. an added new position yeah, okay. when an employee. Um, like, like, All right. Um, gets a position through their RIF rights. I would say typically these were positions that were budgeted and being actively recruited for okay. anyway. So it is an right. overall savings in uh, budgeted salaries. Just curious, what do you do with your old system? <laughs> we, uh, the, so we went, yeah, we went you through. You don't just take it to the dump. What do you do with it? We went through a large uh, process, or a long, I shouldn't say large, a long process of getting all of our information in a way that we could then use it. So when we transitioned to PMA, they not only started administering all of the claims that we received going forward, but also all of the takeover claims that were uh, still ongoing for the state. Plus, we needed to put all of our historical information in their system. So, so we still have the system. So we have, um, the system has been shut down or? Yeah, it was web-based, so it just, you know. Oh. Yeah, they, they took it. Then yep. to, I get it. Yeah, we, we, they, they took it back and they purged the data, our data. But we have the we data. We have it in PMA system that I transitioned mm -hmm. over. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So that was the front page. Go ahead, Mary. Well, and so with your, you're now on their operating system. I assume they're a national or a regional yes. company. Yes. So how do you know that they're complying with Vermont-specific laws? I mean, have, have they modified their managed their, their computer system to be able to say this is what Vermont requires in terms of... Yes, we well in the contract we require that they have a SAS uh, SOC to audit report, which means that they well that's national that's not just for Vermont mm -hmm. but it just means that they have the proper security protocol. Not security that I'm interested in, but Vermont has its own particular in yes. some instances rules or regulate mm -hmm. law mm -hmm. regarding how workers' comp is administered mm -hmm. and what my rights mm -hmm. are as an employee or as an employer. Mm -hmm. how, how do you know that they're applying Vermont-specific regulations to claims that are in Vermont? Because um, I'm reviewing what they're doing pretty much on a daily basis. It's in the contract that they have to comply with Vermont law. <coughs> they're Vermont licensed adjusters. So they all have their license to adjust claims yeah. in Vermont. And that means they have to study they do the, the yeah. rules and the laws and they have to pass the test and do, go to CLE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do the adjusters handle other states or do they handle us exclusively, the five that we have? They handle other states too. So, okay. Mm -hmm. do you, so what do you hear um, from the Department of Labor in terms of their review of our claims? Are they seeing that 
you know, are they asking questions about why did you handle this that way? I mean, that, um, that's, that's right. a nice double check. Right, exactly. The, yeah. Well, they, well, basically, in our contract, we said that they, the PMA adjusters, even if they have other accounts, they have to handle no more than, I think it's 120 mm -hmm. claims, mm -hmm. which is a reasonable a caseload, number. you yeah. know. So, and then the claims audit report, he looked at the claims, mm -hmm. how many, the, their caseload. Uh -huh. to make sure that they're not overburdened because then that's a huge problem. They, they can't keep on top of it. They can't call people back. They can't do a good job. Like anyone that's busy, you don't do as good a job when you're swamped. So um, that, I'm confident, is, is fine. They give a report to us every week on the caseload that the adjusters have because with you know, new ones and old ones and all that stuff, it, it fluctuates, but it's all under the 120. Um, Department of Labor, so their role is um, regulating mm -hmm. and issuing decisions on uh, workers' comp claims, whether or not they're compensable or not, whether or not if uh, PMA is going to stop benefits, if that is um, allowed or not, if they approve it, mm -hmm. and also with any settlements that we enter into, we need to get their approval. So they have been definitely watching PMA. I mean, they are, um, they're on it. They're, I have a close working relationship with them. So if any issues or questions or anything comes up, I would meet with them, yeah. like Steve Monahan right. and Christina Bielenberg. So what I'm asking is, with that review process, uh -huh. is DOL kicking out you know, finding on behalf of the employee as opposed to the employer when they're contested cases more frequently than they had been. So I'm trying to oh, get yeah. a sense is, is of there a the difference? change. Yeah. I, I don't really see a big difference, but I haven't calculated it. Like, I, I would have to look to see how many of the, because um, it's, it's more when it goes to a informal or formal hearing, if there's a, you know, I'd, I'd have to look at that because I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, that's that's a good metric. Third standard. Yeah, that's a good or, metric. A, a, a yeah, third party standard. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, I'll find out. I'll yeah. get back to you. So keep 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 going. Keep going. Yeah. Oh, okay. Page three. Page three. Page two. So oh, okay. we're moving on to page two. Page one is the programmatic savings. Page two is um, another effort that we undertook and this would have been about this time last year and so we went through um, as PMA transitioned on and I just brought in an example uh, we went through every single claim that we had there's a few hundred um, and we went claim by claim and looked at um, what claims that are left over that we can close so every claim has um, costs, direct costs. Um, so uh, an employee, employee gets an indemnity payment, that's a cost. They have to go to the doctor's appointment, that's a cost. Um, but for the life of a claim, we also build in a reserve cost, which means uh, based on this type of injury, we expect over the life of the claim that it's going to cost, you know, $50,000 or $500,000, what have you. Um, so we went through and we uh, looked at every single claim and wondered, does this make sense? Yes or no? Can we close it and reduce the reserves to zero? And um, if you look on the second page, for workers' compensation, um, we there were about 300 claims that were done and closed but still had reserves tied to them. Um, so we were able to just close those all down to zero and we were able to free up $5.8 million in reserves there. And then um, based on uh, looking at claims, asking questions and mm -hmm. using PMA's expertise and precision in uh, calculating the real cost of the life of a claim, um, we were able to reduce the remaining reserves by another $5.8 million for a total of about $11 million overall reduction. And so what that does is it reduces our long-term liability. 
uh, for the overall program. And based on that reduction of our long-term liability, we have an actuarial projection. Um, so these new reserve numbers then got analyzed by an actuary and the, the final balance, if you will, um, that came out when we did the financial statements for the CAFR was about $10 million of freed up cash because we we fully fund this program, which means um, not only the our yearly costs of claims have uh, cash on hand, but also our long-term liabilities. So there's about $30 million, but $10 million of that was tied up in anticipating these reserves we know we're probably not going to incur. So we were able to um, free up a fund balance, which we used in both um, FY18 and FY19 to reduce workers' compensation premiums um, that you saw in uh, both meeting the management savings requirement and in FY19 you would have seen uh, reduced budget requests based on uh, insurance premiums. So, the, so then the question that I have is really based off what you just said. Okay. And that is then going forward for, for state fiscal year 20 and 21, Mm -hmm. Are we going to see an increase, uh, an, an unnatural increase in the uh, in the costs allocated to each of the? I'm looking at the Vermont National Guard, which had said they had a 50 percent reduction in their workers' comp uh, charge for the firefighters, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So, are we going to see an unnatural increase there because we are outside this 10 million dollar window, or you know, what are you anticipating? What what should we anticipate? I don't anticipate a big increase. Um, the numbers that we're seeing, um, I think we still have to get through this year of experience to know for sure um, and get through this year of the CAFR statement. Um, and, there, and I shouldn't say no for sure because in the risk management world, you never know for sure. It's driven primarily on claims experience, but based on our current trends, we are... Um, we're, we're saving money not just through reserves and this and kind of long-term liability. Our da daily practice is also moving in the direction of saving money on the preventative side. We're saving money in medical cost management. We're going to leave you a document. Um, mm -hmm. if I could, uh, we're, we have a copy for you. Um, we couldn't. We didn't have enough copies for everyone. We had to do some redacting, but anybody who wants to look at it can. I'm looking for the medical costs that you have already right yeah. before. Um, we have charts. Of, they review all of our medical costs. Um, and as Rebecca said, we're saving about 43%. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a cost of about two, a savings of about $2 million. So we have a lot of indications that say, even though we've reduced premiums, um, that we're not set up for a getting whacked in 2020 mm -hmm. and having to spike them back up. No. Um, I, think, I think all indications yeah. lead to, we freed up 10 million um, at the same time where we're reducing the costs and kind of bringing everything down to a new plateau Mm -hmm. and using these freed up reserves as sort of um, a new balance. A new balance, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mary? Well, I want to argue with you on okay. that, but it's That's more, great. we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, you used it to buy down $10 million of cost over a two year period. Mm -hmm. And unless you're expecting $5 million of ongoing savings, and it sounds like you're thinking you might get two, it's going to bounce up a bit because you don't, it, you, the ongoing savings off of the reserves is not going to be five million a year or the difference between what, you know, what you're saving in medical and that. So it, it's got to bounce up a bit. But I think we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, only know um, coming, we'll only know more yeah. in, the, in the summer and fall of yeah, this year. Yeah. But, 44% reduction in medical costs is pretty, and that's really striking. And yep, which, it's good. 
It's yeah, amazing. It actually, but it makes me Being nervous realize. about what's it's not getting done. Nervous about what, <laughs> what's you know, not being done. Or, or just, I mean, and, that, and it's not uncommon at all when people change their carriers for mm -hmm. lots mm -hmm. of costs to be squeezed out, back, mm -hmm. squeezed out, but then it creeps back up, too. Um, well, that's where uh, our role comes in, is to make sure it's not going to creep back up. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in the past the reserves had been set and then kind of not reviewed on a regular <laughs> basis. That was one of the problems. So that's why we went through that long process yeah. of looking at every single old claim, you know, because we have claims going back to the 90s, some of them. Mm -hmm. Figuring out why are they open? They should be closed. A person's mm -hmm. back, it's done. So it was, it was just a lot of cleanup that we did mm -hmm. to reduce the 5.8, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And now I think with the light duty, the medical cost management, the safety, things are going to be at a lower mm -hmm. level than, you know, these huge, terrible claims that we mm -hmm. used to see. Yeah. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah, we're thrilled. Sticks. Maureen and Diane? Yeah, I just, I do think there's probably a lot of factors that go into that 42, 44% um, savings or whatever, but I think um, one factor that needs to be considered is that they're doing a better job than the state was. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's what we think. Diane. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm understanding, you you, you sort of like looked at old claims and oh, we you know you've got two dollars left on this, or you want, you, mm -hmm. and collapse that in. That's the first five million. Mm -hmm. But then ongoing, you you're you're saying, you know, I think we've been over booking mm -hmm. a, a, a claim that ooh this happened and we should. Right. Reserve ten thousand dollars for it. When you when you when you have the time to look at it, you go. You know what? We're not seeing that we're spending ten. We're really. I think we can going forward. This mm -hmm. is the other. This is mm -hmm. right. I'm not going to need to book ten. I can book eight, maybe seven, mm -hmm. and still have the same outcome. Am I getting that exactly? Right? People exactly are going to get right. the same outcome. Yeah. It's just that you just had on the books an yeah. automatic yeah. for oh code this reserve that much for it. Right. And you weren't seeing the experience and you can book it a little bit less but not being super aggressive like right. I, I don't think that's and that's where the wait and so see to see if people yeah. people are being served at that exactly problem. exactly mm -hmm. good final question yeah final you're, you're yeah I it. really um, <laughs> so one of the reasons I was interested in having a longer discussion uh -huh. is when we had management in just doing their budget presentations, uh -huh. and as you know, every single department was seeing this, these reductions. And pretty consistently, we or I said, what's up with workers' comp? Uh -huh. And they said, they gave us a number, we don't know. And, and so my, yeah, disappointing, really disappointing. Yeah, that is. They but and I think I portrayed that pretty accurately. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They didn't know. Uh, well, yeah, uh, and so that's what worries me because <laughs> management has to participate yes. in this for it to be successful. Yeah. Good point. Um, so just I, I, it, we have to get the word like out. Doing more. great things, but it needs to be across the board. Yeah. Um, and, and I actually pressed this somewhat with the Commissioner of Human Services or uh, mm -hmm. Resources, mm -hmm. who said. Oh no, we do this training, and you know, again, the right words, but mm -hmm. our experience in talking mm -hmm. to people. And we particularly asked about the VA DOC, which has uh, corrections. Yes. Um, and DOC is very engaged, yeah. I'm surprised. Well, maybe that's just. just you know, the wrong, I was asking the wrong people. Okay. But, they're, but it they're, still matters. Yeah, I mean, no, for management sure. Management has to participate. They have to. Yeah. They yeah. have to be on so, board with this. And know, know what's going on. Yeah. I agree yeah. with you 100%. So, thank you for your work. Sure, it's our pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Thanks for inviting yeah. us. Yeah. And not just that, I'll let all of us say, that's not just, that's, only, that's not the only reason why management needs to be completely on board. They need to know what practices to best expect mm -hmm. and train and expect their employees to follow through on yeah. so as not to get injured in the first place. Exactly. So, yeah. Right. For sure. Thank you very much. Our Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. So Thank you.